No parent should have to bury their child, let alone identify the body. But if not you, then who? They pull back the curtain to reveal your daughter. The sight of her is too much to bear. You look away, only to realize that you hadn't actually recognized the body as your daughter's. You force yourself to look again. You struggle to make out her features. You can only take so much before you have to look away. This wasn't a simple stabbing. This was a frenzied attack that left her almost unrecognizable. You have to do this two more times before you can be absolutely sure that the body belongs to your pregnant daughter. Not only are you left to mourn two lives, but also to consider how anyone could commit such a brutal act, especially to their own child. Spoiled, irresponsible, woefully unprepared, these are the traits we've come to associate with adults who are overly coddled as children. However, these are not the words that would be used to describe Natalie McNally. Sure, growing up as a type 1 diabetic and the only daughter in a family with three protective brothers, the Northern Ireland local was no stranger to princess treatment. But when it came to the person Natalie turned out to be, well, let's just say she wasn't the type to let a pampered early life define her. No, instead of taking the hallmarks of her childhood into adulthood, Natalie became known as independent, spirited, funny, generous, and perhaps above all else, a real go-getter. So naturally, when she went from being a law graduate to earning a degree in marketing and business from Queen's University Belfast, to those familiar with Natalie, it was likely no surprise. And given her vast list of positive qualities and academic achievements, nabbing a marketing position for the public transport company TransLink, well, it was almost a given. Outside of work, Natalie's life was just as full as she spent her spare time amongst family and friends while also campaigning for a cause close to her heart, women's rights. As for her love life, that too seemed to be turning in the 32-year-old's favor. Yep, by August 2022, Natalie had begun seeing someone, a man by the name of Stephen McCullough, or as his fans knew him online, Vote Saxon 07. That's right. Outside of his formal position as a part-time assistant audience editor for the Belfast Telegraph, Stephen not so secretly moonlighted as a YouTuber who founded his channel on reviewing content and collectibles from the British sci-fi series Doctor Who. Wait, there's, there's no legal guff. None. And no big ugly battery compartment either. It's a miracle. I can't quite believe it. They've learned. Before diversifying his virtual portfolio by expanding into merchandise from other franchises as well. You're my favorite deputy. Yeehaw, cowboy. There's a snake in my boot. Beautiful. And while this content may seem too tailored to Steven's own interests to captivate an audience, the over 35,000 like-minded individuals that joined the ranks of his subscribers proved otherwise. Yes, be it Steven's high standards that gave him an air of expertise, his unique ways of destroying collectibles that didn't live up to their on-screen counterparts, his modification of toys to make them bear a better resemblance to what they imitated, or his signature welcome. Hello YouTube viewers and random Doctor Who fans. Hello YouTube viewers and random subscribers. Hello friendos. Uh, or should I say hello YouTube viewers and random Toy Story fans. Somewhere along the way, subscribers went from being invested in Steven's content to the man behind it. This connection viewers felt to Steven went so far that when his mother passed away in 2014 and his father followed behind her the next year, the comment sections mourned with the creator. RIP your dad. I obviously didn't know him in real life, but just judging from his cameos in your videos, he was an awesome guy. Take all the time off you need. We'll understand. Steven, although through words I cannot express the pain you must be feeling currently, I may be able to extend my condolences and inform you that even though most of us haven't met you in person, we are all able to help you through this. I would give you a hug right now if I could. I know what it's like to lose a mother. Even though it's different for everyone, it's painful nonetheless. I am greatly sorry for your loss. Thankfully, Steven's subscribers didn't have to worry about him for long. No, slowly but surely, it seemed the YouTuber was rebuilding his life after the consecutive losses. This included gaining more mainstream success after being featured on a team in the robot-battling television series he often reviewed on his channel, Robot Wars, as well as kicking the smoking habit he developed after his father's passing. I was feeling very, very low. I was feeling very cynical and depressed, and I hated the world. And I've spent the last five years 
desperately trying to build myself back up again. I've overcome a lot. Um, it hasn't been easy. But my last big challenge is quitting the cigarettes. And of course, by 2022, the new and improved Steven was in a relationship, which had already led to an unexpected surprise. Yep, Natalie was pregnant, and despite the news coming just months into their relationship, she was ecstatic. In fact, Natalie's family had never seen her so happy. Steven, too, was fully on board with the pregnancy and even reportedly stopped drinking in solidarity with the expectant mother. The two planned to sell their respective places and buy a home together and, as a surprise to the family members that weren't already aware of the burgeoning bundle of joy, Natalie prepared to announce the pregnancy on Christmas Day. Indeed, Natalie and Steven's lives were finally coming together which made it all the more tragic when their future so cruelly fell apart. It was December 18th, 2022, the night of the World Cup final, and as a born and raised soccer fan, Natalie was at her parents' house with her German Shepherd River, cheering on Argentina in their victory against France. After the game, she told her parents she'd see them Monday or Tuesday, as her mother handed her wrapping paper and a floral arrangement to take home. With her arms full of goodies, she turned to her dog and said, come on, we're going home to the cats. Natalie returned to her home in the Silverwood Green area of Lurgan, County Arma, Ireland around 7 p.m. She'd be spending the rest of the night with River and two cats, as Stephen had informed her he'd be otherwise occupied. Right, I'm off to stream the night away. Wish me luck, he'd texted at 5.57 p.m. I might have to peek at your live stream later, Natalie promptly replied. But as it turned out, fate had something else in store for Natalie's cozy night in. It was 9 p.m. when a woman's screams were heard by two of Natalie's neighbors at Silverwood Green, then silence. The hours ticked by without another disturbance. However, by the next day, Stephen, who hadn't heard from Natalie, had become concerned. He decided to pay his girlfriend's home a visit to make sure she was all right. Once inside, sure enough, there was Natalie, and she wasn't breathing. Yes, both the lives of the expectant mother and her unborn child had been taken. And when it came to how, well, from the blunt instrument injuries to her head, to the compression marks and blade wounds around her neck, the word would be brutally. In fact, while mortuary staff attempted to prepare Natalie's father Noel for the state his daughter was found in, nothing could. The marks on her body, she had bones broken in her neck. She was hardly recognizable to tell you the truth, he told the Irish Times. He gave her a terrible death to tell you the truth. I just hope it was over quickly. The post-mortem also revealed the gender of Natalie and Stephen's child, a boy. He was posthumously called Dean, a name chosen by Natalie and Stephen if they were going to have a boy. When police arrived at the scene, Natalie's dog River, the only witness to what had happened to their deceased owner, bolted out of the crime scene and was hit by a car. Thankfully, Natalie's beloved pet survived and by now should be fully recovered. That's heart-wrenching that River witnessed Natalie's death. Huh? Spill? Oh, hey Spill. I couldn't help overhearing the car accident and want to help out. Help out? Help out our viewers. If an accident like Rivers were to happen to you or someone you love, your injury could be worth millions. Imagine you finish grocery shopping, heading back to your vehicle, when a car strikes you. You're alive, but in pain. You exchange numbers and visit the clinic. It seems like the end of the story, but you're left with intolerable leg pain and headaches, making it impossible to work again, all while facing hefty medical bills. That's what happened to Car Sunner in a similar accident at a Costco parking lot. She sued and won nearly $1 million. That's such a relief, considering she can't work anymore. Where do you even start in that kind of situation? You need to get in contact with a law firm. And I know that sounds scary. A lot of us walk away from injuries thinking it's too complicated, too time-consuming, and too costly to pursue. But maybe be able to solve all those worries with one click, all on the phone and no money up front, using Morgan & Morgan, an injury law firm that has won a lot of cases. No money up front? How's that possible? Morgan & Morgan only receives a percentage if you win your case. They operate on a contingency fee basis. So if you lose your case, you also don't have to pay. And does this pertain only to car accidents? Nope. There are a number of personal injuries that apply. For instance, a success story from their website states Antonia won her case for a broken kneecap resulting from a slip and fall accident in a supermarket after rejecting her insurance company's lowball offer. I've suspected insurance lowballing, but I didn't realize it was a thing. Yes, in fact, one of Morgan & Morgan's recent verdicts won $12 million in Florida. 
That's 34 times higher than what insurance offers there. And no stress on wait times. There are 100 offices across America and a dedicated support staff of over 4,000 available 24-7. So if you think you have a case, you can check out the link in the description or visit forthepeople.com slash spill. And if you become a client of Morgan & Morgan, they'll fight to get you the best results. Thank you, Morgan & Morgan, for sponsoring today's video. Now, back to the story. Once inside the home, police discovered that the blade the perpetrator used, which happened to be one from Natalie's own home, was still there. The blunt instrument, however, was missing. Yet, it wasn't just the state the crime scene was left in that piqued law enforcement's interest, but the person who reported the crime in the first place, Stephen. See, while the boyfriend was quick to shift the blame, telling the police that he knew how this happened and that a person whose name was not released did this, there's a reason why boyfriends make prime suspects. And so, law enforcement arrested Steven that day. The YouTuber, however, turned out to have an airtight alibi. Remember that stream Steven had told Natalie he was doing? Well, as scheduled, the live Grand Theft Auto gaming session, titled The Violent Night Christmas Live Gaming Stream, started at 6 p.m. I just thought, why not? I'm gonna do a live stream, because uh, this day next week is Christmas. Uh, so what more could you want for Christmas other than a, a, an evening with your old pal, Steven? And as officers verified, the stream had lasted until midnight, well after Natalie's estimated time of passing. One thing became clear. Steven couldn't have been in two places at once. So the boyfriend was released, and by December 24th, police announced he was no longer a suspect. But that didn't mean investigators were back to square one. No, in fact, there'd already been a break in Natalie's case. CCTV footage had caught a person wearing a black backpack walking past the Silverwood Greens area of the night of Natalie's murder, giving the person ample opportunity to see whether Natalie's lights were on. A few minutes later, at 8.52 p.m., the person walked back toward the area. The suspect wasn't seen again until 9.52 p.m., almost an hour after neighbors heard a woman scream. This time, they were wearing a change of clothes and calmly walked out of frame. Given the quality of the footage, any facial identification would be impossible. Still, the video was telling. After all, this wasn't someone walking aimlessly around looking for a victim, but someone heading directly towards Natalie's home. And from the seemingly personal nature of the attack, to the fact that no one had heard Natalie's dog bark once the night of December 18th, it appeared the 32-year-old had been targeted, likely by someone she knew. And by analyzing over 4,000 hours of of CCTV footage, law enforcement was determined to find out who. In the meantime, the McNallys were doing everything they could to make sure Natalie's case didn't go cold. With the CCTV footage made public, and Crime Stoppers offering a $20,000 reward for any information that led to an arrest and conviction, Natalie's parents, three brothers, and extended family pleaded for members of the public to come forward with tips. If someone comes forward now with information, that can help and get this person charged and get this person convicted, we'd be forever grateful because it's never too late to come forward and do the right thing by Natalie. The community response was heartening as people across Ireland collaborated with the McNallys in their crusade to keep Natalie's case in the hearts and minds of the public by handing out flyers, hosting memorials, using the hashtags she was only at home and justice for Natalie, and releasing pink and blue balloons into the night sky in a vigil for the departed. Natalie's childhood best friend, Jane Dawren Ray, went so far as to write an open letter to the sorry excuse for a human who took Natalie life. In the post, they attached two images, the first of her and Natalie as children, the second of Jane carrying Natalie's coffin alongside her sister-in-law and her aunt. Whilst I wish the second image did not exist, this is the harsh reality of what you have done, she wrote, addressing whoever had done this before leaving them with a warning. Natalie has an army of supporters across the country who will not rest until you are held accountable. When you have have been caught and punished, you will be forgotten. Natalie, however, will never be forgotten. Her legacy of laughter and joy will live on long after your sorry life comes to an end. But as much as the support from the McNallys received from the community kept them going, nothing could soften the blow of burying a cherished member of the family in the prime of her life. That's never gonna bring Natalie back. 
but that's all we have and that's all we're going to do for the rest of our lives until we get this person behind bars. So while the family took part in interviews and released statements to remind the public that the person responsible for taking two lives on December 18th still walked among them, it was clear Natalie and baby Dean weren't the only ones that had been robbed of a future. I was delighted to be pregnant and this monster took it away from us, you know, it's unbelievable. I can't actually put into words the heartache we're experiencing. She was a life and soul of our family, and we were heartbroken. She will not be sitting around the table with us this Christmas day, or any day. Have you ever seen my, my mum and dad, our mum and dad's house, and you see the Christmas decorations? And it must take them a week to, a week to put the Christmas decorations up. And we said, well, why do you do so much? And they said, this, you know, this will be for the grandkids one day, you know? And then finally, they were going to have a grandchild, and then... Away, you know. On January 28th, 2023, a rally was organized by the National Women's Council to honor Natalie along with her unborn child to help end violence against women, a cause Natalie, if she'd still been around, would have wholeheartedly supported. And there at the event, among the crowds of over a thousand attendees, weren't just community members, local politicians, and Natalie's family, but a grieving boyfriend. That's right, Stephen too had been crushed by the tragedy and had come to lean on the only other people who would understand what he was feeling, Natalie's family. He'd become a regular guest at the McNally household, and the toll Natalie in their first child's passing had taken on him was clear as day during these visits. He is devastated too. He lost his wee baby, Natalie's father told the Irish News. Still, Stephen had not just pushed through his grief to attend the rally, but had also managed to edit together clips and photos to honor his girlfriend. This video is a montage of memories of Natalie, and this was put together by Natalie's loving partner, Natalie's brother Declan told the crowd. Please keep Natalie's partner in your thoughts and prayers. But as the community mourned, the case was about to crack wide open. By this point, multiple unnamed suspects had been arrested and let go. However, those 4,000 hours of CCTV footage had yielded some results that were, well, of interest. For one, police had released video that that showed what happened after the suspect disappeared heading towards Silverwood Greens at 8.52 p.m. on the night of Natalie's passing. The footage showed the person walking down Natalie Street toward her door, with the reverse lights of a vehicle briefly illuminating their figure. Still, the mystery suspect remained unidentifiable. But then, officers stumbled across some higher quality video. At 7.09 p.m. on the night of Natalie's murder, unreleased CCTV footage captured a man walking from the direction of Lindsburn towards a bus stop at Kingsway Dunmurray, where he waited for 15 minutes before getting on a TransLink bus. Yes, the company Natalie coincidentally had worked for. The person's face was carefully covered with a hood and a scarf, and they carried a bag for the supermarket chain ASDA, which police believe contained the black backpack seen later in the CCTV footage. Once on the bus, the figure went to pay, but dropped their change. They bent over to pick the coins off the ground but their black gloves were too thick, so they proceeded to take them off, revealing a second pair of gloves. These ones, however, were latex. Marigold kitchen gloves, to be precise, which were an exact match for the blood-stained print law enforcement found at the scene. Throughout the ride, the mystery person sat motionless, aside from checking to make sure their face was covered, even going so far as to take a swig from the Coca-Cola they brought with them under their face covering. Eventually, the suspect exited exited the bus at Market Street in Lurgan, where they walked through the town, past the war memorial and police station, until they reached Natalie's development. And while this footage might not have revealed the suspect's face, there was something law enforcement couldn't help but notice. See, from the suspect's build, to their height, to the distinctive way they walked, they bore a striking resemblance to one person they were already familiar with. Stephen McCullough. But that was impossible. After all, in Stephen's own words, he had been streaming the night away on October 18th. Then again, there were comments the YouTuber had during the live broadcast that, looking back, became unsettling. See, while the stream may have provided Stephen with the perfect alibi, something about the video was a little too perfect. From the double checks that he was still live. Is it streaming? Yes, it is. Oh, thank God to his inability to interact with viewers who were watching the stream. Can't look at the live chat for some bloody reason, because if I do, it makes it, the whole thing freeze and OBS just screws up. 
and his excuse for not looking at the live chat on his phone. I've decided that I kind of hate live streams where people just sit and read comments and go, oh my God, yes, ask me questions better. Um, and also, if I go on my phone for too long, I'll end up just scrolling through TikTok. It seems Stephen wasn't just focused on gaming, but spinning a narrative. One that would exonerate him from the crime that was set to take place that very night. And if the live video wasn't enough to convince cops of his innocence, the fact that Stephen was drinking, despite the alleged promise he made to Natalie to abstain, made it clear he had no intentions of leaving his home. <laughs> I just realized I'm literally going to be drinking and driving. In the game, by the way, I'm, I'm not leaving the house tonight, so um, yeah, in the game I will be drunk while driving in the game. Yes, unprompted, Stephen had managed to answer any questions law enforcement might have had about his alibi or character, almost as if he knew they'd be analyzing the upload. I was reading somewhere recently, like the, the amount of police force that we have lost over the last 12 years is just frightening and no wonder crime is on the rise. That's why I like sticking to just doing crimes in a video game. Yet regardless of Stephen presenting himself as an upstanding citizen, there were moments in the stream that almost seemed to hint at the tragedy to come. Sometimes these were just comments. In a world of cockroaches, be a spider. Or looks into the camera. Welcome to the party, my dear. That suggested Stephen knew something his viewers didn't. Attack, panic, attack. That's what we're doing. Other times, however, the YouTuber's actions seemed less open to interpretation. Take, for example, the bloodthirst that Steven displayed during his gaming. Often die. No one's coming to save you. Oh, look at the droplets of blood. Just like the rain. Beautiful stuff. I did hit you, and I liked it. Or the time he appeared to mind the actions the killer took that night. <laughs> And then, of course, there was Steven's choice to take on the Waste the Wife side mission, where the player had to kill a woman with his car while making it look unintentional. Here we go. Make her look like an accident. Well, that's alright. I've made my entire life look like one. See, Steven initially failed the mission, but decided to take another crack at it. I'll try that mission again. Because <sighs> I almost had the f and it wasn't just the YouTuber's dedication to taking the female NPC's life that, in light of Natalie's death, seemed eerie. Why can't I just shoot her? So much more straightforward than this. But it was the fact that at the same time the killer was supposedly inside Natalie's house, Stephen was singing. I need to kill this. I need to take her down. And this wasn't the only moment the stream mirrored the timeline of the murder. No, only 26 minutes later, around the time it was estimated that Natalie's life was taken, there was another strange occurrence. Steven was off screen taking a break when the usual live stream back soon screen was briefly interrupted with the poster for the 2021 James Bond film, chillingly titled No Time to Die. The YouTuber was quick to claim this was a mistake. I just sat down and I pulled the controller and the headphones off the table, which hit the keypad, which um, it's apparently hotkeys are still connected, so it, um, it went on to something else for a little second. But if this was an accident, could the same be said for saying his girlfriend's name on the stream? Absolutely. not Lee. Absolutely. And how about those moments where Steven seemed to expose something dark brewing beneath the surface of his cheery YouTube persona? Ah, oh, off. You don't know me. You don't know what I've suffered. Get the f at me, why? Steven's gonna lose his sh do da do da. Steven's gonna lose his sh oh do do da day. What the f is it dick? 
Were these moments also being misread in light of Natalie's death? I've realized I'm a very angry drunk. <laughs> But in real life, of course, I'm, a, I'm an absolute sweetheart. Or was the YouTuber's mask slipping? There is no filter between my brain and my mouth. I just start talking. The evidence was definitely compelling, but for all the telling statements... I'm making the most out of my free time now, well, I've still got it. And knowing smiles... I actually think it'll, it'll be a really f***ing good Christmas this year. But yes, sorry, I'm, I'm getting horribly distracted. Perhaps Steven was as good of a guy as he claimed to be. I don't have too many loved ones in my life, but the ones I love, I love with all my heart. After all, the YouTuber had been live streaming in his home at the time of Natalie's death. And there's no way for someone to be in two places at once, right? But then there were the statements of a taxi driver that had been parked in Lurgan on the night of December 18th, who identified Steven as the person he had picked up just after Natalie's life was taken. Yes, according to the driver, he had been booked to take a passenger to an address in Lurgan, but when Steven allegedly entered the vehicle, the YouTuber reportedly claimed he had a change of plan and instead wanted to be taken to Lisburn as his mother was sick. The taxi company later received a call from the person who booked the ride stating that the vehicle hadn't shown up meaning that Steven would have happened upon the taxi after allegedly committing the crime. Not unlike the way he had in GTA. Is there a taxi? Oh god, let there be a taxi. There's a taxi, yay. The driver then allegedly dropped Steven off at a house at 11.13pm. However, since the YouTuber didn't have enough fare to pay for the ride, he went into the home to grab cash. He then reportedly came back out, paid the driver, and collected his bags, which he threw over the hedge of the property. However, the driver wasn't the only one who had identified the passenger. No, according to the taxi's GPS tracking data, the passenger had been dropped off at quite the incriminating location, Stephen's house. And further data law enforcement gathered implicated the boyfriend all the more. See, Stephen's phone had been inactive since 6 p.m. that night and was only swiped open at 11.16 p.m., three minutes after he was allegedly dropped off by the taxi. As for the data on Steven's computer, well, that tore the YouTuber's once bulletproof alibi to shreds. Yep, it turned out Steven's livestream wasn't live at all. Cyber experts who analyzed the device found the video had been pre-recorded, meaning when Steven claimed he couldn't read the live chat or double-check that he was streaming, the YouTuber was fully aware he was the only one present during the recording. I think I'll wrap up this stream with none of you watching at all. But unfortunately for Steven, law enforcement wasn't as easy to evade in real life as they were in a video game. <laughs> I can outrun a police car, f yourself. The YouTuber was interviewed by police eight times, each time refusing to comment. However, when Steven was made aware there was evidence that his livestream was pre-recorded, he provided police with a written statement that admitted the livestream had been recorded on the night of December 13th and into December 14th. Still, the statement maintained that Steven hadn't left his house the night Natalie's life was taken, and that instead of streaming, he had spent the night drinking and had fallen asleep before waking up at 11.16pm to swipe his phone open. As for the taxi, he claimed that while he wasn't the passenger, someone had been dropped off at his house that night and came in. According to Steven, he didn't know who they were. However, when it came to Steven's new version of events, law enforcement wasn't convinced, and on January 31st, 2023, the YouTuber was arrested for the second time. Naturally, the betrayal among Steven's fans who'd supported the creator through his various losses was immense. I can't believe it. Holy sh! it's crazy to think what a monster has been watching when I was just a kid. You betrayed everybody. Steven, I watched you for many years. I looked up to you. You inspired me. But then you ended that poor girl's life. That was horrible. Your actions were horrible. You're horrible. You're an irredeemable monster. I still respect the content you made, but I no longer respect you. But of course, it wasn't just Steven's fan base who'd been convinced of his innocence. The McNallys had allowed their daughter's boyfriend to mourn with them. 
They had allowed him to take part in a rally honoring her life. They had allowed him into their home. The family had given Stephen 20 minutes alone with Natalie's body on Christmas, under the impression they were leaving their daughter with her grieving partner, not the man who had allegedly taken her life. And when it came to Stephen's reported constant inquiries about the investigation, the family had done their best to keep him in the loop, although their efforts clearly weren't enough for him. No, Stephen wanted to be privy to what the family talked about, even when he wasn't in the room. So, he left his phone at the McNally family home, set to audio recording. Luckily, due to the position of the phone, Stephen only captured 40 minutes of muffled conversation. However, Chief Inspector Neil McGinnis believed this was evidence of an attempt by Stephen to find out whether the family suspected him. What he planned to do with the information remains unknown. On February 2nd, 2023, Stephen was formally charged with the murder of his girlfriend, Natalie McNally. And in March, the 33-year-old appeared over video call from McGabry Prison for his bail hearing at Belfast High Court. Naturally, the prosecution argued against the defendant receiving bail. During the hearing, they claimed that Stephen's fiendishly titled Violent Night Stream was not only a ruse to keep his name off the suspect list, but was littered with brazen and taunting messages, including the No Time to Die poster placed at the exact time he planned to do and eventually did execute the murder. But while it's easy enough to argue that Stephen took Natalie and Baby Dean's lives, the prosecution also had to answer one major question that still loomed over the case. Why? Why had the boyfriend taken the life of his girlfriend and unborn child? Well, the prosecution believed they'd found the answer, and it was right there in Natalie's phone data. They claimed that Stephen had devised his cold and cynical plot after finding out Natalie was communicating with another man. That's right, Natalie had exchanged 33 WhatsApp messages three days before her life was taken. As for how Stephen would have known this, a family member confirmed that Natalie had given Stephen her passcode about a month before her death, and on December 17th, when Natalie was spending the night at the YouTuber's house, her phone was unlocked nine times from midnight to 9.54 a.m. What's more, the data showed that her WhatsApp and Twitter were open during this time without exchanging any messages, as if someone was looking for something. Disturbingly, this theory mirrors an allegation Stephen's former partner made against him in 2019, where she claimed he had found something in her phone that he didn't like and then became violent. The allegation, however, was later withdrawn and the prosecution has not proceeded with this claim. But while Natalie's WhatsApp messages may have been the final straw, that wasn't to say Stephen had decided to take his girlfriend's life that next day on a whim. After all, he had recorded his stream on December 13th and, as the prosecution revealed during the bail hearing, had researched the most painful ways to die weeks before taking Natalie's life. Yep, on November 12th, 2022, Stephen's browsing history showed a search for whether it was more painful to be shot in the head or the heart. He then asked his browser, which is less painful, drowning or burning to death? And would you rather drown or be shot? and is drowning a painful way to die. His search history from the end of the month exposed further searches on the subjects of drowning and unconsciousness. The degree of planning and level of sophistication shown by the individual who has committed this crime, along with premeditation, deceit, and efforts to conceal, is something that the courts in this jurisdiction will rarely have seen, prosecution barrister Natalie Pinkerton told the courtroom. As for the defense, Barrister Craig Patton poked holes in the theory that Stephen could have taken Natalie's life. He informed the court that his client had no previous criminal record, the taxi driver that identified Stephen would already be familiar with him through the media, and the CCTV footage of the suspect never revealed the person's face. We have heard a lot about the suspect on the bus, but we heard very little about how he is purported to be that person, the barrister told the court. In the end, due to Stephen's risk of fleeing, reoffending, or interfering with witnesses, the judge denied his bail. The trial is set for September of this year and will last from three to four weeks. Stephen has pleaded not guilty. In the meantime, it's in the public's best interest to exercise one trait, restraint. 
See, as people across Ireland pray for justice for Natalie, the Attorney General's office has reminded the public that they are held to the same standards of journalists when it comes to social media posts. And that means posting speculation, rumors, or opinions that interfere with the orderly process, well, it can result in contempt of court and, in turn, no justice. Still, for those hoping to alleviate some of the pain Natalie's loved ones are feeling at this time, there are other ways to show your support. In December 2023, the McNally household that in previous years was full of decorations and guests for the holiday season was particularly bare. Their daughter's favorite time of the season was now the anniversary of her passing. Every year we'd have decorated this house from top to bottom. People joked it was like the Home Alone house, Natalie's father told the Belfast Telegraph. We'd put all the decorations up, the house was covered in decorations when the police called to tell us Natalie was dead, which was just horrible, and we'd started taking them down. Well, other people did that for us. This year, there doesn't seem much point. When I think of Christmas now, I think of Natalie's coffin in the wee room on Christmas Day. That's my Christmas now, and always will be. Still, the money the family had raised with the help of their community through events and fundraisers to end violence against women has provided the McNallys with a purpose. Campaigning has been a great comfort to us. To think that you can do something positive, Natalie's mother told that paper. It's hard to go on, but we will go on. We'll go on for Natalie. If you want to honor Natalie's memory, consider donating to the National Women's Council or another women's charity of your choice. If the allegations against Stephen McCullough are true, his entire stream on December 18th was a charade. It's, it's criminal. It's criminal time. You know, it's time to be a Scrooge, be selfish. Designed to throw suspicion off of him. Again, I have no idea how long the stream's gonna last for before either I get too drunk, too tired, or I just give up. While simultaneously hinting at the evils he planned to commit. So I thought you were supposed to like run him off the road and kill him, much like your woman. Oh god, in that earlier mission. And if this scheme seemed fundamentally flawed, that's because it was. After all, in the end, it was Steven's overconfidence in his alleged plot that ultimately failed him. I think I'm gonna be okay. Famous last words, of course. But I think I'm gonna be alright. And leaves the people who trusted him this person is the danger to society. Still searching for answers. This is the story of Stephen McCullough, the YouTuber who allegedly used his platform to craft the perfect alibi.